I told you that we were going to go into even more nerdy detail than I typically do. Um, keep in mind that even this list on this page is actually dumbed down quite a bit, um, but I do want you to leave 151 <clears throat> with a basic understanding of um, how these adrenergic and cholinergic receptors um, affect the body so that you can understand how different pharmaceuticals, different drugs work on them, okay? Now, I say four types of receptors. This actually is five types of receptors, sorry, I added one. <clears throat> but they fall into the categories of alpha and beta, right? Now, the alpha, um, from a drug point of view, are maybe a little bit less important than the beta ones. <clears throat> but let's talk about the alphas. Alphas fall into alpha one and alpha two. Uh, make sure that you know the definitions that are bolded and green um, on this list, right? Alpha one is actually available in lots of places. And when it is activated, and by the way, what activates an adrenergic receptor? Epinephrine or norepinephrine? That's why we call them adrenergic receptors. So when <clears throat> epinephrine or norepinephrine hits an alpha-1 receptor, those alpha-1 receptors are attached to machinery that when it gets activated by the receptor, it will cause the constriction of smooth muscle. Now, when you are fighting or fleeing, when, where do you want smooth muscle to constrict? Well, not around the blood vessels to your legs. You want that to dilate. Not around your airways. Again, you want that to dilate. When alpha-1 receptors, when, when they get activated, they are attached to a machine that will cause constriction of smooth muscle arterioles. And that is why when someone suddenly gets really bad news, all the color will drain out of their face because of constriction of the smooth muscle wrapping around the arterioles, sending blood to the brain, right? The reason that less blood goes to your digestive system <clears throat> when you are you know, running away from a saber-toothed tiger is because of alpha-1 receptors being activated. Now, this, this concept um, explains why a single uh, hormone or neurotransmitter epinephrine can cause constriction of arteries in one area, but opening of arteries dilation in another area. <clears throat> because beta-2 receptors, they are connected to machinery that when the beta-2 receptor gets activated, it will cause smooth muscle to relax. And when smooth muscle relaxes, the airways get bigger and arteries to, that are activated that way also get wider in diameter. Someone wants to go outside. Say hi. No? <laughs> so uh, alpha one and beta two are kind of the opposites of each other. Um, now let's talk about beta one. Beta one, is particularly found in the heart. And when it gets activated, it will, it will trigger mechanisms that through some very clever sub mechanisms end up increasing how quickly and how strongly heart muscle is contracting, right? So when we want smooth muscle rate to relax, we would attach epinephrine to beta two receptors. If we want the heart to beat harder, we would attach epinephrine to beta-1 receptors. And if we want uh, the skin to uh, get uh, smaller uh, diameter blood vessels or the intestinal tract, we would activate alpha-1 receptors. By the way, when, when doctors give you an injection of local anesthetic, there generally is a little bit of epinephrine in that injection. Why do they put in epinephrine with the local anesthetic? You know how local anesthetics work. Why the epinephrine? The epinephrine 
is meant to activate the alpha-1 receptors to cause the little arterioles in the skin to constrict. So when they're suturing, there will be less bleeding. Just like it all makes sense, right? So if I ask you, what does epinephrine do? Well, epinephrine can constrict smooth muscle. It can dilate smooth mu muscle. It can activate the strength of the cardiac contraction. It can make the heart beat faster. It can do all of those things. Now, I want you to go back to thinking about hormones. And I want to remind you that molecules are distinguished as being a hormone or a neurotransmitter. They are all communication molecules, communication molecules. Those communication molecules will activate mechanisms. <clears throat> what the communication molecule makes happen, it's not really the molecule that's making it happen, right? See, that's what's so confusing. Why does epinephrine cause smooth muscle to contract, but it also causes smooth muscle to relax? Because the epinephrine's not doing it at all. The epinephrine is acting like a key. <clears throat> if I told you that I've got a key that opens doors, but starts cars, you would not be impressed. You would not think, oh, what a remarkable thing that can open doors and also close, start cars. You would go, well, the key's not doing anything. The key's just turning a mechanism, and that mechanism is starting things, right? So when epinephrine binds to, binds to alpha-1 receptors, it'll cause constriction. And when epinephrine binds to beta-2 receptors, it'll cause smooth muscle relaxation. And this is how releasing epinephrine into your body can make your heart beat faster, can make the smooth muscle around your bronchi dilate, can make the smooth muscle around your arteries going to your digestive tract constrict, can make the smooth muscle around the arteries going to your skeletal muscle dilate. All of those things. Okay. Now, because these are different receptors, they have got slightly different shapes, right? The shape of this lock, the alpha-1 lock, is slightly different from the shape of the beta-2 lock. You know, I don't know, you probably know this too, but like faculty members, if you're full-time faculty, you've got one key that opens like five different rooms. If you are part-time faculty, you've got a key that opens two of those five rooms. They don't have different locks, they just have a different key, right? So my key is like epinephrine. It opens up all of these guys. But because these individual locks are slightly different, these receptors, like they're locks, they're slightly different, we can invent a key, a drug, that will bind here, but it won't bind here. We can do that, right? And and so knowing about the different receptors allows us to design very specific pharmaceuticals. We're going to talk about that right after we talk about these terms, agonist and antagonist. Antagonist is a term in literature. I, I don't know what it has to do with anything here, but when we design a drug, if that drug, or it could be a natural poison existing you know, in plants or something like that. And a drug that is described as an agonist, it will bind to the receptor. And when it binds, it will create the effect that that receptor normally would create when it's natural ligand, in this case, epinephrine, because right now we're talking about uh, adrenergic receptors, epinephrine and norepinephrine and norepinephrine, both of them, okay? An agonist will bind and create the effect it was meant to. An antagonist will bind, but when it binds, it does not cause the effect. As a matter of fact, when it binds, it's kind of like putting chewing gum into a lock. It binds, but it does not open the door, right? Now, drugs that are called antagonists are very often known as blockers. So there's a whole category of blood pressure drugs called beta blockers. And now, without having to memorize it, you know what they do. Because you know that 
adrenergic receptors, receptors come in alpha and beta. And if this is a drug that blocks beta, then it would bind to beta receptors and keep epinephrine from affecting them. So theoretically, if I gave my patient a high dose of a beta blocker and then he got something happened to him that was very stressful, his heart rate would not go up, his airways would not constrict, and he would not get that flushed feeling that people feel when they're super nervous or scared. Why? I gave him a beta blocker, so I put gum on all of these receptors. So even though that person was very scared for some reason, they would not feel the physical effects of the adrenaline in their system. By the way, beta blockers uh, get used uh, sometimes by musicians that get stage fright because they have to have very steady hands. And if they take a beta blocker, it does not actually make them any calmer, but it does mean that when they get nervous before a performance, it doesn't make their heart pound and it doesn't make their hand shake. And then they don't feel as nervous and they can perform the way they want to. All right. So agonists and antagonists. Now, one more thing. Sympathomimetics and parasympathomimetics. These are also drugs that are going to uh, cause either upregulate, well, usually upregulation of either the adrenergic system or the cholinergic system. If I give you a drug that is a parasympathomimetic, I am giving you a drug that might be an agonist for receptors or it might work by a different method. So sympathomimetics are not exactly the same as adrenergic agonists. Um, enough nerdiness, they're similar concepts, but they work by a different mechanism. Okay, so let's use this. Beta-2 receptors, when they're activated, they dilate bronchioles. If someone's having an asthma attack and you need a drug to dilate that person's bronchioles, what will you grab, right? Pause me, take a moment, look through your notes, try to baffle this one out before you listen to the answer, okay? All right, here comes the answer, okay? So beta-2 will dilate the bronchioles when something sticks to it, and we want that effect, so you want a beta-2 agonist. A beta-2 antagonist would make things worse, right? And beta-1, this is heart. By the way, for me, I don't know if this is useful, but I had trouble remembering beta-1 and beta-2. And the way I remember it is for some reason, whenever I say heart and lungs, I always say heart and lungs. I never say lungs and heart. You know, that might just be because of my medical background though, so I don't know if it's useful. But that's how I remember beta-1 is heart, beta-2 particularly lungs, not just lungs though. Okay, okay here's another one. The sympathetic nervous system can cause the heart to beat faster. Which one of these would make a good drug to slow down the heart? All right, pause me, try to work it out just with your notes, all right? So the sympathetic nervous system makes the heart beat faster by using beta one, okay? So when we use beta one, so it has something to do with beta-1. However, if I gave them a beta-1 agonist, that would make the heart beat faster. So if I wanna throw some chewing gum, that would be a beta-1 antagonist or beta-1 blocker, that would slow down the heart, okay? Another way to slow down the heart would be to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system but we're already going pretty deep into the weeds, so. Okay, we're going to start here at the beginning of our next video.